So tonight will be special babies with special needs. Uh, I'll be introducing Dr. Chang. So Dr. Chang is, as I said, a, a professor of obstetrics and gynecology here at the UW School of Medicine. And she's the medical director of the prenatal genetics and fetal therapy program here at the UW Medical Center. Uh, she's also um, medical, <coughs> excuse me, medical director of the prenatal and infant care center a clinic here at UW Medical Center. And she also has another appointment, which we call an adjunct appointment, adjunct professor in internal medicine in the division of medical genetics. And she's program director of the prenatal diagnosis and treatment program at Seattle Children's Hospital. Her clinical ex expertise is in prenatal diagnosis, diagnosis, genetics, and maternal cystic fibrosis, and in women and fetuses with genetic conditions. She earned her MS degree in genetic counseling at Sarah Lawrence College in Bronxville, New York, and her MD at the University of Washington, right here, where she also completed her residency. She's received numerous awards, including the prestigious UW Service Excellence Award, and she's been named as top doc in Seattle Magazine uh, multiple times. So I'll now turn it, off, turn it over to Dr. Chang. Dr. Chang, thank you. Well, hi. I'm glad to be back. I had a great week of skiing. It was wonderful. I didn't break anything, but then I go super, super slow, as my kids say to me. I'm just waiting for you at the bottom of the hill, Mom. Um, so tonight, I am honored, actually, to be part of a team uh, with Dr. Brown to talk about um, special babies and fragile babies and what we do prenatally and what he can do postnatally. I am going to concentrate on, basically, um, three conditions that we see prenatally um, and kind of walk through some of those conditions with you. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll get, actually I was, gonna, I was gonna make a mini test for you, which I forgot to do, but I think you'll be okay. Okay, we're gonna start off with the first condition, it's called gastroschisis. Um, it is basically known as a, it's a right-sided kind of hole or abdominal um, defect, uh, wall defect, um, to the right of your belly button. And it, is, it, it occurs in supposedly three to five um, babies per 10,000 births, but I can tell you that it's definitely increasing worldwide. Um, and in, in some ways, we seem to be maybe having an, an epidemic of this in the state of Washington. And there are lots of reasons um, that have been notions about the etiology, one of which has to do with nutrition. Um, but we're, um, we're seeing an increase of this worldwide. 15% um, of uh, gastroschisis babies have uh, other anomalies, and less than 2% of them have a chromosome abnormality. Most of the time, they're identified during um, a mid-trimester ultrasound. And actually, nowadays, with the ultrasounds being so good, we will often see them as early as 11 to 12 weeks of pregnancy when we get that first ultrasound. Um, as with gastroschisis, so what happens is that there's a hole um, in your abdominal wall just to the right of your belly button. And since your intestines are down uh, in that area, in your abdomen, the intestines basically extrude out into the amniotic fluid. And um, because of that, there often is a concomitant sort of what we call malrotation in our intestines um, or valvulus where it gets all twisted and obstructed um, and therefore creating what we call necrotic or dead bowel. Um, and therefore bowel perforation. Uh, sometimes there is what we call intestinal atresia where parts of the intestine basically um, are not formed appropriately. Um, it's associated with growth um, abnormalities. These babies tend to be smaller than average. Um, and also with what we call amniotic fluid abnormalities where it tends to, um, these pregnancies tend to be associated with decreased um, amniotic fluid or oligohydramnios. All of this makes the care of the pregnancy with the gastroschisis um, pretty high risk. So this is an early ultrasound of a fetus that is at 13 weeks gestation. Um, and here, it's lying on its back. So here's the head. Here's the abdomen. And here's this fluff up here. Um, and that's actually bowel extruding outside. And so that would be, if we saw that, um, and that would be a gastroschisis, or we would suspect that. This is another look at cross-section of the fetus, of an older fetus, 
And here you have the abdomen here in cross section. Here is the spine. This is to color code for us. This is the umbilical vessel, um, umbilical artery coming out. And to the right of it is, again, this tuff. Um, and this is your gastroschisis. So this is your small intestines kind of just sticking out, hanging out in the breeze. This is um, a large, this is an older fetus, um, obviously at 30 weeks. And um, to orient you, what you have is that this is one's um, skin. The, this is the top of the uterus right here, bottom of the uterus is right here. And this is a limb right here, but this black stuff here is amniotic fluid. You see all of these loops here. And this is um, the bowel that's floating out in the amniotic fluid. This is large bowel, and these little loops are small bowel. So this is um, what it would look like. So this is actually from a patient of ours um, prenatally, where, again, you see these loops here. This is amniotic fluid. Um, and again, umbilical cord showing that um, the umbilical cord is actually very intact. And this is actually what it looks like. And here's the umbilical cord on the side here. So, but what's really neat about this, and I know that that previous picture looked kind of, ugh, is that um, the, once the baby is born, we put the baby really in this, in this plastic bag so that we can protect the bowel um, and we can keep it moist. Um, and that is what we use to transport the baby. And so this is what it would look like. Um, and the baby's kind of lying on its side. And there's some um, warm curlex um, here with some saline, and the bowel is in here, and it's all just wrapped up here. Um, so what happens is that once a baby with gastroschisis is born, it, we go to the operating room. We try to go to the operating room, and we try to just kind of push the bowel back into its little defect and then basically close it. And we can do that about 85% of the time very successfully. And this is what it would look like. So again, umbilical cord. And this defect is really, really small. So it's pretty amazing that all of this is out there. And you just kind of gently just push it back in, and um, you would just close it. Um, and it, you know, we, just, we just had several deliveries, actually, um, um, uh, in the last couple of weeks of babies at 37 and 38 weeks that went to term with sort of the bowel out here. And we would get a call from the, from the surgeon over at Children's the next day and said, everything's in. And we just closed it, and it's just amazing. Um, okay. And so, and this is what this little gal would look like, and here's her little band aid. Um, and one of the things to remember, though, is that uh, some of the complications, it's not as simple as pushing the bowel back in because the bowel needs to function, right? And so that is the next piece of it. So 15% of the time, the intestine will not immediately fit back into the abdominal cavity. Um, and so remember that, you know, as you are gestating as a fetus, the abdomen grows relative to the stuff that's inside of you. But if you have things that are outside of you, then the, the, your abdominal muscles and your skin is not going to grow because there's nothing in there to sort of help grow. So it's going to be smaller. So sometimes, you know, you just can't push everything back in because there's no room in there. And so you have to give time for the abdomen and the baby to grow to create room so that you can gently push the bowel back in. So in, in about 15% of the time, the intestines won't um, fit back in. And so in this case, we do something called um, a silo, and I'll show that to you in a minute, and that you slowly, gently, kind of gently push um, the bowel back in. So, and here's the, the abdomen, the opening, and we actually sew this bag here, because remember, we want to keep it moist, and we want to keep it from being um, infected. And so, and this is what it would look like. And you can, again, appreciate that here's the umbilical cord, and this is to, um, um, to the, actually, it is to the right umbilical cord, but we just pushed it over, so, okay. And so this is um, permanently, we're suturing it, suturing it onto the skin now, here, um, and then closing it off. And you can see how big all of this bowel is, and there's no way that you're going to push it back in. And then over uh, time, we would gently squeeze the bowel back in, and we're allowing the baby also to grow. 
And then this would be what it would look like um, at the end after we've closed it. So, you know, when we have families with gastroschisis, we talk about the fact that um, the surgical part is actually pretty easy. But the road and the journey really is after the bowel is all back in um, because the bowel has to work. Um, and, you know, for those of you who've had, sur who's had surgery before? Who's had abdominal surgery? Remember, if you've had abdominal surgery, it took a while for your gut to start working again and that you could feed because bowel just doesn't like to be touched. And the longer you're in the operating room and the more you touch it, the more it just kind of stays paralyzed. Because the job of your bowel not only is to absorb nutrients, but it's also to squeeze in peristals in a regular way so it can move things down and out. And so when we're in the operating room um, for a long time with our abdomen open um, and uh, manipulating our bowel, the bowel basically freezes. And so it takes a long time for it to sort of get back into um, um, action. So if you can just imagine that in gestation, my bowel was, was out floating around the amniotic fluid as opposed to being inside, I don't developmentally necessarily know what to do. And then once I'm born, I've pushed everything back in, and now I'm in a place where I don't really used to be. Um, the journey for the family is really getting the bowel um, working, and therefore there's feeding issues and there's absorption issues. Um, and so um, it's not unusual for these kids to need nutritional support um, in the form of um, IV nutrition or TPN. Um, total parental nutrition to support the baby until the bowel actually gets, um, uh, until the bowel works. And it's, you know, it's not unusual that the surgery may be successful, you know, within a couple of days, but the baby is still in the hospital um, for, you know, weeks um, and even months before we can um, get the bowel working. What's really key is, if you notice this last sentence, is that I always tell moms that when your baby is ready to um, take food, breast milk is still the best thing for that gut. It's the most gentle. And so um, moms are always pumping and storing her breast milk until the baby is ready to start feeding. So other post-operative post problems is that, remember, we talked about the fact that um, sometimes um, the bowel, the intestines, there are portions of the intestines that did not form correctly, and so there would be an automatic blockage. Um, and so that's called pieces, segments of atresia. So you would have to sort of cut that out and then reconnect the um, pieces of bowel together, and that sometimes may require second surgery. Um, necro necrotizing enterocolitis is a very bad infection um, of the gut. And then, of course, people who are on um, TPN for a long time can um, run into some liver problems. And then some of the kids have a lot of um, uh, GERD or gastroesophageal reflux. So I've told you about the baby piece of this. And so what do we, um, what do I, um, representing maternal fetal medicine, do um, to help that baby have the best kind of postnatal um, experience. And the first piece, our job, is really to avoid pre a preterm delivery. So if, you can, if we can appreciate the journey that that baby has to go through, and that's a full-term baby, if we add prematurity issues to that baby, then it's even more difficult. So our job, really, is to do everything that we can to prevent a preterm delivery. And I always tell my moms that our job, really, is to have you have a that a baby is possible and as term a baby is possible. That's really our goal. Um, there's, a high, there's a high stillbirth rate in um, gastroschisis, and so our job is, again, to decrease the stillbirth rate. Our job is also to have a vaginal delivery. Um, and actually, it seems counterintuitive, but it actually is um, a better thing. The bowel is squishy. It's not going to do anything bad. Um, and it's better for everybody actually to have a vaginal delivery. And if you think of mom who has an uncomplicated vaginal de delivery, recovers quicker, she can get to her baby and be with her baby um, quicker than being, you know, um, having a C-section. So that's one of the first questions, you know, after we make a diagnosis of gastroschisis is the mom will say, I have to have a C-section, and the answer is a big no, okay? 
and then immediate access to neonatal support and treatment. So you can see that having guidelines um, for even the community, nurse, community nurseries, um, if we have an unexpected um, gastroschisis delivery, that they have those guidelines and understand how to take care of that baby and keep that bowel moist and, and, and warm um, uh, is, is really critical. So how do we maternal fetal medicine um, specialists do all this prenatal stuff um, to give our pediatric colleagues the best baby possible? So for intrauterine fetal demise for gastroschisis or stillbirth, the stillbirth rate is 10 to 12% without any monitoring. So in the old days when we didn't have the ultrasounds and the fancy ex um, external fetal monitoring, it was a 10 to 12% fetal death rate. But even with all of the fancy monitoring that we have, we've only reduced the um, mortality rate to still 2%. And if you compare that to the average pregnancy of an uncomplicated pregnancy, the stillbirth rate in North America is about 1 in 125 to 1 in 150. So just a t touch under 1%. So 2% stillbirth rate is actually a very big stillbirth rate. You know, that's unacceptable for us, right? Um, and unfortunately, it's real. Um, we also, unfortunately, while we delivered a number of good, healthy gastroschisis babies, we actually did have a stillborn the other day at 29 weeks. So these numbers are real, and we do live it every year. Um, so, what do we, so what do we think, how do we go about doing this? Well, the truth of the matter is that we actually combed the literature and had a whole group that reviewed all of this. Um, and the literature doesn't really help us in, in directing, saying this is what you need to do, this is really what we should do. But what we did as a, a group um, was to come up with the best evidence um, in framing some antepartum surveillance. That's both reasonable um, for the patient um, and for healthcare dollars and also for outcome. And we came up with basically something called uh, NSTs twice a week starting at 32 weeks, meaning that once I hit 32 weeks, I'm going to see my doctor twice a week, and I'm going to go on the monitor, this external monitor that we have here, and we're actually going to look at the fetal heart rate over 20 minutes to half an hour to an hour to see what the baby's up to. And I will have to say kind of anecdotally that um, there, I, I think that um, babies have stomach aches too, and we've had some situations um, anecdotally in the past where sort of noticed that there were some, maybe some bowel things going on, and the fetal heart rate tracing looked a little unusual. So again, there's, there's no science to this, but it's just based on experience. So we start this at 32 weeks, and for, the, um, for an, a gastroschisis that is otherwise uncomplicated. If a baby has any complications, like it's small, or the fluid is low, or we think that um, there is abnormal bowel dilatation, we would initiate that monitoring earlier um, and see if we can capture any um, issues um, early. And I would have to say that with this implementation, at least um, we've, you know, our, our stillbirth rate is probably less than 1%, but we are going to be reviewing our data with that. Timing of delivery. So I can tell you that having done this long enough, we started out 30 years ago with being so anxious that we would deliver these babies at 34 weeks because it was like, okay, we've got there, we've got there, we got to 34 weeks, the neonatal intensive care unit can take this baby, we're just, we can't take this anymore. And so we would deliver these babies at 34 weeks, um, opting, right, for decreasing the risk of a stillbirth, but trading it off for um, prematurity issues. And our surgeons, our colleagues at Children's said, hey, you know, guys, this is really great, but, you know, we're just having a lot of trouble now with the preterm stuff. We were able to close the gastroschisis, it's not a big deal, and what we're now dealing with is all the preterm issues. Can't you do something? And so we kind of went, okay, okay, okay. And I remember going to going and saying, okay, we'll get to 36 weeks. We'll do two more weeks. And so we got to 36 weeks, and you know, we thought that was great. And our colleagues came back and said, we're doing better, but man, you know, we still have these issues with these, these kids are still small. You know, they're four and a half pounders, they're five pounders. Can't we get them bigger? 
And so we went to, and we kind of like gingerly went to 37 weeks. And we stayed at 37 weeks for a super long time because in, in OB, 37 weeks and greater is term, right? If mom came in at 37 weeks in labor, we would never stop for labor because that was the definition of term. And we just could not let go of 37 weeks. And, and then we, and then, you know, our colleagues came back and said, you know, it's still, you know, we're doing much better, but, you know, couldn't you, like, push it just a little bit more? So, and that was really what started this whole review of the literature. Could we push it to 38 and 39 weeks? And if we pushed it to 38 and 39 weeks, what are we going to do? Because we know that we've got 37 weeks, we've got a good kid if we delivered that baby, right? So what are we, what are we going to be losing? So, and I have to say in the last three years, we've actually pushed it to 38 and 39 weeks, and I, I like it. Um, so what we do know, what we do know is that delivery prior to 37 weeks, um, these preterm babies had longer length of stay, so in the hospital, longer time to what we call enteral feeds, which was actually taking oral feeds. Um, they had a higher rate of sepsis or infection. Um, and sometimes they, you know, they need to be ventilated. So um, they need to be intubated and ventilated. So that was a reason to at least get to 37 weeks and even push it even longer. Um, more recently, um, we have um, learned that there are issues with the 34-weekers to the 37-weekers, or 36 and 6 sevenths weeks. And that is that there's that fine-tuning of your lungs and your brain um, that is really still critical. And that if you could, even if with the gastroschisis, if you can stay in mom, you would actually do better later on in life as you enter middle school, as you enter high school. The subtleties of the higher cognitive function, um, you know, is important. So I think this idea of, well, um, you know, if there is a reason for to deliver you at 35 weeks, of course we should do it because it's a safe thing to do. But it's almost like now this kind of elective idea, well, you know, I just don't want to be pregnant anymore, or I'm, my doctor's going out of town, or this or that, and I want to be induced at 38 weeks or I'm done at 37 weeks because it's term and that's the definition of term, just really doesn't cut it anymore. These babies actually, unless there's a good reason to deliver you, these babies need to stay in, even babies with birth defects. So we carry that mode of 30, getting past 37, even getting to 39, to our gastroschisis baby, to our congenital heart defect babies, to as many babies as possible. Uh, mode of delivery. So again, I said earlier that um, C-section is not the answer. Um, we actually have good data on that one. And that babies with gastroschisis have exactly the same amount of what we call fetal distress in labor than any other baby. Or um, another way to look at it is that they do just as well in labor as any other baby. Um, and, that, and then they're intuitively, you know, in the past, people would say, well, oh my gosh, you know, if the membranes rupture, if the bag of water is ruptured, there isn't any of that fluid protecting the bowel, and that's going to be bad. And the answer is, you know, it's going to get infected or something. And the answer is not associated with anything different than any other pregnancy that breaks their bag of wa um, water spontaneously. So, so we reserve C-sections for the usual obstetrical reasons, not because you just have gastroschisis. So my mantra is vaginal delivery is recommended. This, we know that C-sections don't improve neonatal outcomes. And, um, and the flip side is that the C-section will increase complications for mom, decreases the amount of time that um, she has with her baby, um, that interval time, because she's going to have to wait and recover from the section before she can go be with her baby. Um, and. Um, Vaginal delivery is not associated with increased length of stay, with infection, um, with neonatal death, or success of any kind of chosen um, closure method. So what we do, and I, from this slide, these next two slides really um, is the approach that we in the prenatal diagnosis team um, here in at Seattle Children um, uh, uh, 
apply to our families with any um, child with a birth defect. And so it's just that our gastroschisis um, approach, this formal approach, is the paradigm that we use for all of our birth defects. And the idea is that this is a very family-centered care. It's collaborative um, and it's multidisciplinary. Um, in terms of making the diagnosis, the diagnosis is made with maternal fetal medicine specialists, it's made with our, general, um, our surgical colleagues, it's made with our um, radiology colleagues that specialize in obstetrical imaging. We actually convene and we actually look at the ultrasounds together and we talk about it. Um, it's educating ourselves because every single baby is a new piece of education for us with the natural history of gastroschisis and of course it's educating the family. Um, we consult with the pediatric surgeons. Um, they meet with the surgeons ahead of time so that they know what the plan is. And if it's another condition like a renal disease or something else, neurology, um, neurosurgery, it's whatever subspecialist is involved in that organ system. Neonatology, the highest pediatricians, because these are the folks who are going to take care of your baby as soon as it's delivered. I'm going to be handing that baby to the neonatologist, and that neonatologist needs to transition that baby and stable that baby um, for transport to Seattle Children's. And then maternal fetal medicine, because there's a plan for taking care of that pregnancy. Practical preparation for the families, right? We have, we're the WAMU region, right? So we have Alaska, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming. And so what we have families coming out from Montana housing, um, where are we going to put them? Um, resources um, for them, transportation and, uh, and financial concerns. So we create a prenatal, what we call a prenatal passport, and it's basically a checklist that these are all the things that we are going to be doing with the family, making sure they have information packets. We have a video that I'll show you a little clip of later on um, that we've met with all the people so that the family's all prepared ahead of time. Um, and they tour children's, they, um, they tour the university um, labor and delivery, et cetera. Okay. So that's, um, so gastroschisis is the first abdominal wall defect. The second abdominal wall defect that I am going to talk about is an emphalocele. And the reason I am doing this actually is because these are favorite topics to give to medical students because they are rich in test questions. Um, um, be, and uh, both the medical students and the residents, because although they're both ab abdominal wall defects, there are very clear differences that have test questions that are very clean, and we love giving those test questions. So I put these side by side. So gastroschisis, so we're going to go to omphalocele. So unlike gastroschisis, an omphalocele is a central, it's a defect centrally located where your belly button is. It failed to sort of close. And so what you have is, is a central defect at the base of the belly button. So if my umbilical cord comes in here to my belly button in utero, and if this didn't close, then I have this big defect like this, and my belly button is here, and then I've got this big sac. And then my abdominal organs are inside the sac. Okay? And unlike gastroschisis, omphalocele can often have the liver herniating through in addition to bowel, okay? So then, so these are test questions, and I didn't make the test, so you don't have to remember them, but if I did make the test, these are the questions I would ask you. So the other difference is that 30 to 50% of emphalocele, babies with emphalocele have other additional birth defects, and they're serious. They can be heart defects, they can be cleft lip and palate, um, they can also have chromosome abnormalities and, and or genetic condition. In contrast to gastroschisis, where we rarely find a chromosome abnormality and we rarely find an additional defect, okay? And delivery, delivery, C-section, automatic C-section, okay? And interestingly, the stillbirth rate in emphalocele is not as high as um, gastroschisis. So here's an ultrasound. Um, of an, uh, of an emphalocele. So here is the actual abdomen itself. And this is, a, this is what we call a giant defect. It basically goes side to side because here's, here's the side of the baby, from side to side. And this is just wide open. 
here's the membrane here, here's the umbilical cord. So the stomach is in this sac, here's the liver, and here's the bowel, as we've identified. So it's big, okay? So this is called the giant omphalocele. This is, um, this is actually a picture of a baby that we currently now, um, we haven't delivered yet. She's due in a couple of weeks. And this baby has a giant omphalocele as well, because this is the cross-section. This is actually the abdomen itself of the baby. And this is the emphalocele with liver inside. So huge, OK? And this is the picture of a baby that we delivered a little while ago. And um, the parents um, sent us these pictures. And so this is, um, she, so this is a giant emphalocele. And what you'll see here is that we, it's too big for us to push everything back and then close immediately. So we do something called an an antibiotic paint over the um, sac. And over time, we let kind of epithelialization or skin kind of grow over this. And then we later close it. So this is the beginning of her journey. And so, and over time, because it gets a little, um, she gets bigger, it actually starts getting pushed in. And this is her all wrapped up with her little donut. And this is her closed. So and basically, these kids, postnatal management, primary closure for very small defects. Large defects, they have complications because basically, same with gastroschisis, right? You have all of this out here. The abdomen, abdominal cavity is very small. If you push everything back in, you're going to create all this pressure inside. And that is going to be a problem with bowel necrosis, sepsis, and respiratory um, a compromise. Because again, you push everything back in. Your lungs aren't quite, it's pushing against your lungs. So you have respiratory issues. So oftentimes, with large defects, we don't actually go to the OR immediately. And we start off with non-surgical management, silo with gradual reduction, very similar to our gastroschisis. Um, others, we have something called an ACE bandage, where, again, we put an ACE bandage here, and over time, and we just keep compression, let the baby grow. And over time, the ACE bandage gets a little bit tighter so that the bowel actually kind of starts falling in by itself. And then the last is what we saw with this last baby, which is an antibiotic cream paint causing epithelialization, skin growing. And then we come in and close it later because it actually then later becomes, it looks more like a hernia. And so we would just close it that way. At the Delivery Hospital, a team of specialists is ready to care for your baby and to arrange travel by ambulance to Seattle Children's within the first few hours of life. The team is led by neonatologists, pediatricians specialized in caring for high-risk newborns. The newborn team is usually present uh, in the delivery room when we have a baby uh, going to be born with gastroschisis. After doing a quick newborn assessment uh, of the infant, um, we then um, have to uh, stabilize the baby. Because of the exposed uh, bowel, there is a risk for uh, loss of water and heat. The lower half of your bo the baby's body will usually be placed in um, a, a plastic sheet or a bag in order to make sure that the bowels themselves are as moist and warm as possible. During that time, your baby will have a nasogastric tube, so a tube passed from the, either the nose or the mouth down to the stomach in order to drain gastric um, juices as well as air. By doing that, we help maintain and limit how distended the intestines can get. Throughout the uh, newborn stabilization process in the delivery room, uh, we encourage any family member who is present to watch the whole process and be with us and see the baby. After this, we will take the baby to the mother so that she can touch the baby, look at the defect along with the baby, as this may be the only time she gets to see the baby before the baby goes in for surgery. The nurses will then start an IV access and for IV fluid placement, as this baby will not be fed uh, for 
uh, quite some time. So that is the journey of gastrostesis, and that's often the journey of um, an emphalocele. And, um, and our babies um, do actually reasonably well. So the next that I'm going to very briefly touch upon, because um, I'm really looking forward to Dr. Browd's um, talk about um, congenital hydrocephalus, because as a perinatologist, it's probably one of the hardest um, uh, congenital birth defects for us to diagnose prenatally and to provide um, guidance um, with respect to outcome. So congenital hydrocephalus, or um, a lay terminology is water in the brain, um, is, has many, many, many causes. Um, there are infectious causes, there are just causes, and there are genetic causes. From um, the simplistic point of view of an um, obstetrician who does an ultrasound, we see that um, uh, this is the picture of a fetal head um, at about 20 weeks gestation. And this is a picture as if I kind of took my head this way, and I cut it open, and I'm looking down. Um, so this, this is the front of the head. And so this is right, and this is left. This is the center. And you see some midline structures, but most importantly is that we have these two little um, uh, crossbars here, and these are what we call our lateral ventricles. And inside is this structure called the cord plexus, and it makes the cerebral spinal fluid that circulates um, through our central nervous system and bathes our brain and our spinal cord. And that's about all that I can know to say about any of this. So, unfortunately, this is a patient of mine who, um, this is a little bit old, uh, older gestational age. Um, this was closer to about 24 weeks, and we did an ultrasound on her, and we saw this. So can anybody tell me what's going on here? Big fluid, and this is the lateral ventricles here. What's going on here? This is the cord plexus that's floating in this fluid. And so, um, so we found this at about 24 weeks. Um, and at that time, we also have three-dimensional ultrasound because we were concerned that actually the fetal head was a little bit larger um, because of the expanding um, ventricles. And so we, we did a 3D and got a sense that this fetal head was a little bit bigger than we would expect. So we followed her during the pregnancy, and this was um, uh, at around 30, 35 weeks or so. And here, again, the head is um, just, the inside of the head is basically filled with fluid. And you can see the crossbars showing that the lateral ventricles are now almost three centimeters. Which that means, so tell me, if you have this space, and you have your skull, and you have inside, you have these ventricles that are expanding. What's the space between the lateral edge of the ventricle and the skull? What should that be? Brain tissue. So um, we were concerned um, that the compression against here would impact the development of the brain. Um, and what the cognitive function. I will tell you that from, again, a very simplistic um, maternal fetal medicine specialist is that um, you can't predict prenatally what the cognitive function. You can be very concerned, but you can't be sure. Um, and so that's, very, that's been frustrating for us to give some level of prognosis. Now, it turns out that this particular baby actually has a genetic form of hydrocephalus. Um, he has an X-linked um, gene causing hydrocephalus. Um, and we did find that out ahead of time through an amniocentesis. And to that extent, we were able to provide the family with some um, discussion about cognitive function. Um, but there are situations where when we don't have an etiology, we won't know until the baby's born. So, I'm not going to talk any more about congenital hydrocephalus because that's sort of the extent of my knowledge, and we'll leave that for Dr. Brown. 
But I want to move to a different um, area, and that is that of the mother. So we've talked a lot. We spent 40 minutes on the um, baby. And as a maternal fetal medicine specialist, I have two people that I take care of. So the mother and the baby. And what I do to one has to be balanced with the other and the risk to the other. So in many situations, when we do everything for the baby, we may compromise mom. And I think that, as every parent knows, you would stand in front of a Mack truck for your child. Um, the balance in talking to a family is for everybody to understand what stack standing in front of a Mack truck means. And so in, 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 in particular with congenital hydrocephalus, sometimes the um, head gets so big that even if we did a C-section, the uterine incision has to be so large to accommodate the head that it has true significance and major impact for her future reproduction, okay? And that makes subsequent pregnancies high risk. And, in, and to that extent, it makes the next children high risk for other reasons, right? So let's go through what a, a C-section, what types of C-sections there are. There's a low transverse which is your standard C-section that we do, usually at term when you know, you're, you're in fetal distress or your baby's too big and doesn't fit through. So what we have is, um, here's the uterus. It's an upside down pair. And we make an incision right here um, in the lower um, uh, uh, part of the uterus, um, right above the pubic symphysis. And generally, you know, we deliver the baby. It's called a low transverse or LTCS. When we have a, um, a classical or vertical incision is exactly that. We would make an incision along the length of the uterus. So you can see that the length of the uterus is larger than the width of the uterus. So if I'm faced with a situation where the low transverse um, measurement isn't going to accommodate the delivery, I will have to make a vertical. And there are, these are great test questions also, because there are implications for um, each one of these. So if you do a low transverse cesarean section, um, it's relatively safe to have, a, um, to have a trial of labor in subsequent pregnancy. We call it a vaginal birth after cesarean or a VBAC. The risk of uterine rupture is about 7 per 1,000, which is actually a fairly low risk in order to have a vaginal delivery. The issue is that it's not always an option that you can VBAC, depending on um, the community in which you have your prenatal care, because the prerequisite for having a VBAC is that in case there is a uterine rupture, you must have capabilities of immediate response, because it can be life-threatening for mom, it can be life-threatening for baby. So that means you have, to, you have to VBAC in an institution where there is a surgeon, a physician in-house, there's anesthesiologists, you know, nursing staff, operating room, blood products, whatever. So you can see that in, there are communities in which that's just not possible. Um, even though philosophically a physician supports VBAC, if he or she does not have this backup, then it's not safe. And so that person, that mom, is then destined to have C-sections for the rest of her pregnancies. Okay? And with it comes abnormal placentation. Um, if you happen to implant your placenta underneath that scar, in some cases um, it causes um, um, basically the placenta to basically invade through the uterine scar um, through the uterus. And you again wind up um, having the placenta not separate at the time of delivery and again hemorrhage. And you wind up having a cesarean, um, actually a hysterectomy at the time. So not a in, you know, inconsequential issue. Classical cesarean deliveries are kind of even worse because it's a vertical incision. Um, and the VBAC is absolutely not recommended because the risk for uterine rupture is actually quite high. And because the, you, you, the risk of uterine rupture is quite high, these women are actually delivered preterm to avoid the risk that she would labor spontaneously and rupture her uterus. So again, we just went through the discussion about even these late pretermers have issues. And so really the mantra is, you know, we try not to do the C-section. But here's the, 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 um, the balance. Some of our fragile babies, in order to give them the best outcome possible, requires 
that mom takes the full burden. So, um, so for you, so as you go out and practice medicine and you talk to families, it's really important to have a balanced point of view um, with these um, with our families. <laughs>